I'm so delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, the 2023 Rose Wilgamuth Weissman Women's Voices Lecture. For those of you who are new to the BNC, the Baker Nord Center is the intellectual and social hub for amplifying the arts and humanities at Case Western. Our mission is to support the arts and humanities through fellowships, grants, symposia, and public-facing programming. <laughs> Before I introduce our distinguished writers, I just want to share a little bit about how the structure of this event came to be. Instead of the usual traditional lecture format, I wanted to bring two writers together in conversation. Writers who knew each other, writers who were writing across the themes of difference in their work, writers who had something to say about justice and whose work touches on the idea of the speculative. Indeed, this fall, Baker Nord's theme for our programming is speculation. And many of our events take up the concept of speculation and the speculative. These concepts have encouraged scholars and artists to ask questions about the status quo, about the overlooked and taken for granted, archival silences, and the boundaries of knowledge production. And both of the writers tonight grapple with this idea of speculation in complicated ways in their work. So to introductions. Marjorie Hudson, to my far left, is a fiction writer, memoirist, and community activist. Her short story collection, Accidental Birds of the Carolinas, was a Penn Hemingway honorable mention, and her creative, Travel log slash history slash memoir titled Searching for Virginia Dare has become a favorite teaching tool in creative nonfiction writing programs across the country. Her recent debut novel, which we'll be talking about tonight, Indigo Field, digs into the hidden history of an abandoned field as well as the deepest secrets of its black, white, and indigenous neighbors. In 2000, she founded the George Moses Horton Project to inspire and educate children and adults about this enslaved man, George Moses Horton, who's from North Carolina, who sold his poems to buy his freedom. She has led efforts to recognize this poet statewide and locally, and to produce and place a historic marker, and to change the name of a historically segregated middle school in order to honor him. She's also a fierce advocate for and builder of literary community. I can tell you, many mentoring roads across North Carolina, regionally and nationally, lead back to her. I know that personally as someone who has benefited from her mentoring related to creative writing and watching her work over the last decade. Through Marjorie, I learned about Jocelyn Johnson and fell in love with her work. And you'll hear soon about how the two of them know each other. So an introduction for Jocelyn. Jocelyn Johnson is the author of My Monticello, winner of many awards, including the Library of Virginia Fiction Award, the Weatherford Award, the Balconies Fiction Prize, and the Lillian Smith Award. My Monticello was also named a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. Her short story, Control Negro, was anthologized in the Best American Short Stories, guest edited by Roxane Gay, and read live by LeVar Burton. I just want to die right now. Just, um, that's a, such a cool thing. She's a veteran public school art teacher, and Jocelyn is passionate about the transformative power of creativity and the arts in young people's lives. So they'll be in conversation with each other. They're going to read from their work. And at the end, we'll get a chance to ask them questions. And a book signing and sale will follow. Without further ado, please help me welcome Marjorie Hudson and Jocelyn Johnson. Hi, Marjorie. Hey, Jocelyn. <laughs> it's really good to see you again. It's nice to see you. So, yeah. So we're so. going to talk a little bit about how we met, which Michelle alluded to. Um, Jocelyn came to a workshop in the North Carolina mountains that I was teaching in 2015. Yeah, you remember better than I do, I think. It was a strange summer, but it was a wonderful group of writers. And we kind of bonded that week about how great the work was in our workshop. 
And some of that work was Jocelyn's and her story, The King of Zandria, was wonderful. I remember, whew, it was so empathetic. It was so insightful and so beautifully written. I think we all said, you need to send that out, Jocelyn, and you did. And now it's in um, her collection, uh, My Monticello. And in Prime Number magazine. Yeah. So, Mar so yeah. So I always have these good ideas of going to a writer workshop uh, out in some rural place, uh, <laughs> driving by myself from Virginia. It sounds really good. It's affordable. It looks beautiful. And then I'm driving and I'm passing like Confederate flags, and I'm thinking, was this such a good idea? Am I going to arrive home safely? Mm -hmm. And so that was one of my experiences of going to the place where Marjorie and I met. But ultimately, so far, I always arrive, I get there, you know, and I got there to a group of writers that were welcoming. Uh, I workshopped this story with them that Marjorie then really encouraged me with and suggested a place to, to submit it, which had ended up winning this um, literary prize, which was a much needed um, uh, attention and care. Because when you're a writer, you send out things all the time and you get so many rejections. It's so nice to get like those moments where someone recognizes something you did is worth publishing. So she, that was really helpful to me. And so I'm so glad. So yeah, yeah, so always looking for community. You know, we're writers, we work alone, but we are constantly looking for uh, groups, mentors, uh, just places where we can uh, reflect our work out, see what it is, and decide how we want to hone it to make it, to make it better. All right. And uh, we need truth tellers, people who can reflect back to us uh, what's working, what's great, what's almost finished, what needs a little more work, that sort of thing, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm gonna, so I think we're gonna start just by describing our books just a smidge and reading a tiny bit so you can get a feel for how they sound. Um, do you wanna go first? Thank you, I'd love to. So, Indigo Field, it's a novel about a field in the rural south, and in this field, there are centuries of hidden a black and indigenous history. Um, and under the surface, the surface is sort of rising uh, when the story opens, and uh, archeologists come and start digging up the history of the field and the spirits rise and all hell breaks loose. So that's the, it's, there's sort of a, um, what I call mystical realism because the trees have embodiment, they have opinions, they have thoughts, um, animals have thoughts. So there's, there's this kind of uh, mystical aspect and the spirits have a lot of opinions about the past as well as the present day people. And two of those people I will introduce and read a little bit about. Uh, one is the Colonel, Colonel Randolph Jefferson Lee. Yes, it's a reference to Mr. Jefferson. And he is a bird out of water. He's living in a retirement village. He's not from the South. He's not comfortable. It's a little too snootsy for him. And so he's a runner. And just to get away, he runs every day across the highway where nobody knows him. And he goes to the top of a, of a ridge where there are these big pine trees. And he feels comfortable there. And then he spies on the field. He doesn't know its name. And he spies on the hard scrabble farms uh, that are, you know, within view. He finds comfort there. Miss Reba Jones is the other main character, and she is one of those hard scrabble farmers. She's uh, an elderly woman. She's lived there all her life. She knows all the secrets in the field, but she's not telling. And she is black and hiding her Tuscarora heritage under her black skin. On the day they collide, their worlds collide, the colonel is out for his regular run, and Miss Reba has just been grieving the loss uh, of her beloved niece um, through murder. Uh, and the, the sentencing has just come down for this, this killer, 
and it's come out manslaughter with a very light sentence. And so she's got that strange combination of grief uh, merged with a sense of injustice and wanting some vengeance. So on this day, she's doing her errands downtown in the little town of Quarryville. Miss Reba goes to the counter to order scratch at the Quarryville feed and seed, 50 pounds. And the man says, you got it behind a bit, Miss Reba. Got to pay each time now. She pulls out flabby ones and some coins from her change purse. When she gets back to the car, the new stock boy has piled her bag of scratch in the trunk. White boy's got no manners. Didn't ask when you want it, where you want it, Miss Reba. Supposed to put it on the passenger seat sitting up so she can slide it onto the porch. How the blue blazes will she haul it out now, her back the way it is. Miss Reba's made it this far, so she decides to get all her shopping done at once. A pack of hot dogs, more grits, and a bag of rice from Piggly Wiggly. You can make things stretch with rice. She pays and gets her bags. Near the door, a bunch of church people are standing around the newspaper stack talking about today's news, gossiping. They look up and see her jump like they've seen a ghost. They nudge each other, hush their children, mouths fallen open or slammed shut. Didn't see you standing there, Miss Reba. Nobody says, have a blessed day. Church people loved Danielle. Miss Reba heads home and it starts to drizzle. She turns on the wipers. The windshield smears with bugs and dust. She grips hard to the wheel to keep from going into the ditch. With a load of chicken scratch in the back and the road wet, this car rides heavy and wants to veer. Up ahead, there's that white man in a red ball cap she's seen before, jogging in place in front of the sunrise gas and grill Skinny white legs sticking out his shorts, talking on a cell phone. Old man should have more dignity than to run around half naked like that. She's looking at him so hard that for the first time in her life, she misses her turn onto Field Road. Now the man comes to cross the highway, not looking where he's going, Face still in that phone, and her with ball tires, road wet, got to jam on brakes and slide to stop. Man runs into her car, hits it hard, goes down, cell phone flying, and she can't see him. Lord Jesus, has she killed a white man in broad daylight right in, him, in front of the sunrise grill? So when she gets home, she sees a dent the size of a white man's thigh in the side of her big old car. And she sees that her car is rusted through and the man who sold it to her must have put that coat of black paint over top to cheat her. And she decides that on this day, here is one white man who is going to pay for the damage he does. So My Monticello is a collection of five short stories and a novella. The novella takes up a big chunk of the book. Um, they're all set in my home state of Virginia. And uh, they're about home, belonging, you know, kind of interrogating what it means to feel at home in your space, in your body, in your country. Um, and usually when I read, I start with the inaugural story, Control Negro, the one that LeVar Burton read, which I was so excited. Um, but I'm going to, which is a story where uh, a professor, a black professor, Cornelius Adams, creates, basically um, conducts a scientific experiment, a sociological experiment, where he compares his own son's life to these young white college students. So he's a scientific control, control Negro there, hence you get the term, and he's looking at He's basically wanting to test America's promise. If given the right circumstances, could America extend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Could they extend these gifts to, to, to someone like me, too, by using a son? But today, since I'm with Marjorie, um, I want to read the beginning of The King of Sandria, which is the story that I workshopped yes. with her and that I, um, 
and that I, uh, I uh, that also in, you know made its way into this collection. And the King of Xandria, even though it's, it sounds like a, a middle grade fantasy <laughs> title, but it really isn't. Although that would be cool too. Uh, I'm just gonna. It's the story of a Nigerian father who comes to Virginia, finds himself kind of stranded in Virginia with his kids, and he's just kind of a fish out of water. He's kind of figuring out his grounding. So I'm gonna read a little bit of that. The King of Xandria. Mr. Atta thinks of this exiled place as Xandria because Alex is the name of his only son, his last best hope. The boy is 13, still in junior middle, but Mr. Atta has a daughter as well. Justina works double shifts at the paper store, leaving their flat in drab trousers and polished loafers as if she were a man. Whenever Mr. Mr. Atta sees her, a hummingbird quivers in his throat. His baby girl, mired in that lowly job, and yet her job has grown superior to his because Mr. Atta has lost his, although he must not let his children know. Back home, outside of Lagos, before his wife was torn from this earth, when Justina still covered her hair in bright fabric and Alex donned his school uniform, Mr. Atta was patriarch then. He would arrive to work barrel-chested and angle himself behind his polished mahogany desk. He remembers the potted geranium near the window, the one Miss Ebay would water before bringing his tea. Mr. Atta mourns all of it, the squeak of the window fan even, his oscillating view of lagoon. Now he and his children are stranded here in Xandria, here in this new and baffling place. Justina has grown as petulant and fat as a steer. Whenever she surveys him, Mr. Atta feels weak beneath her gaze, but there is still Alex, his son. I'm just gonna stop there. And then, um, I also, just because it is a collection and every story has a different voice, uh, I thought it would be nice to read a little bit from a different story. And I just have to shout out, you know, the standard in American publishing is to, to start with a novel, to debut with a novel. And I just wanna shout out for story collections. There's something I love so much about story collections, which is that they resist the idea of one story. And so even though my book centers um, black storytellers, there's all this variety, uh, not only in the age and gender of the storytellers, but also um, just in their sensibilities and what they have to say. And so in one story, I can talk about one thing and another, a totally different thing, and those things can be in contradiction and conversation with one another. Um, with that in mind, I'm gonna end by reading just the first paragraph of the novella, My Monticello. Um, this is the story of a young, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and it's the story of a young local who lives in Charlottesville. She's a University of Virginia student. Her name is Denasia Love, and she is talking to us from Monticello, and she's kind of gonna tell you the story of how she, she arrives at that place. And as a setup, I'll just say, this was written after the experience of living in Charlottesville, Virginia um, in August of 2017. I don't know if any of you remember August 11th and 12th of 2017, we were the unwitting host of Unite the Right, which was a white nationalist rally uh, that was hosted in our town uh, in, in around the idea of our discussion of whether to remove Confederate statues or not. Um, and it, it, was, it, it began, just to give you a feel, with um, a lot of torch-wielding people circling Thomas Jefferson's statue on the University of Virginia. That was the appetizer, and it ended with a young woman, Heather Heyer, being killed when one of the Unite the Writers purposefully drove a car into a crowd of counter-protesters and, and killed this young woman and injured a bunch of other people. So, didn't know how to react then. This is how I reacted. I wrote this novella. My Monticello. We claimed it first, this little mountain. Me and Ma Violet 
and a scattering of neighbors, all of us fleeing First Street after men came to set our row of ten roofed homes on fire. The men came at dusk, blaring an operatic, oh say can you see? White heads rose up from dusty jeeps and dark hair thrashed in a harsh new wind like tattered flags. Ours, the men shouted. Their rifles gleamed as if they'd only just been bought, a megastore militia. Through a hasty breach in Ma Violet's blinds, I even saw a boy among them, blonde and sneering in a pickup window. Men leapt from back seats, sprang out of truck beds and rushed toward the faces of our homes. White hands clutched metal canisters, swung torches, spilling flames. Bright shouts, the rising haze of smoke, all that and more rousted us out. From our patchy front yards, we saw bodies blur as some of our neighbors charged forward to try to stop them. We saw a teen struck with the butt of a rifle, his temple spraying red. A toddler flailed, diapered and clinging to its mother's hip as she sank knees first to the sidewalk. What we saw in those moments riveted us and then it set us free. I get excited about the rhythms of sentences and paragraphs and all those things, so that's so beautiful. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the role of history and research. Uh, and your My Monticello course is based on Thomas Jefferson's historic home on a hill. Um, it's a historical place, and you also researched the Hemings family, and for those who don't recall, the Hemings family were enslaved people who Thomas, the people have done research to discover that uh, Thomas Jefferson's DNA is in Sally Hemings family's descendants. So it's an interesting complexity of history. Um, so I know you probably went to Mont to Monticello, the park, you know, the National Historical Park. I've been there. The story they tell has changed over the years, I'm sure. And what do you, what do you see how it has changed? What do you see about how it's changed while you were doing your research? And did what you found make your story deeper fictionally, or did it hem you in? Yeah. So I'm gonna try to talk really loudly. Let me know if I'm doing okay. Um, so yeah, I went to, before I ever wrote this, I'd gone to Monticello. If you live near like a national landmark, you know, sometimes you have to take a guest up there or, you know, I've gone there with my like, um, we have a huge South Carolina Black Family Reunion and once they came to Charlottesville and we all went up there in matching t-shirts, Monticello will never be the same. I've gone up there with my, <laughs> with my partner's family who are white Northern North Carolinaers. His grandmother like stole seed pods from Monticello's garden and they couldn't not let her do it because she's just that person. And so the story Monticello tells itself is constantly changing. Right? So it used to kind of exclusively be a story about Thomas Jefferson's brilliance, uh, his intelligence. And then over the years, it has expanded. You know, there's been, and an, an, oh, and the, and the slaves were well cared for, kind of as an addendum to that first story. Now, Monticello has really transformed the story it tells of itself, and they've included kind of in their um, aim having ins the descendants of enslaved families be part of it. There's a whole, you know, kind of collecting those stories and having that be part of it. So it really did change over the years to the, benef uh, to the benefit of everyone. So if you go to Monticello now, you're going to hear uh, about the Hemings family. You're going to hear about the enslaved people. You're just going to hear a, a broader story. It's important to just remember history is the stories we tell ourselves of something. And so for me, I will just say I'm a lousy historian. I did not go into the Library of Congress and like take like detailed notes. I really depended on a couple things. I read, I wanted to read Thomas Jefferson in his own words, so I read notes on the state of Virginia. 
uh, which is his writing about Virginia, which was perfect for me because my project is Virginia. And then I also read Annette Gordon Reeds, um, who is a historian who wrote the, the Hemingses of Monticello. S super smart lady. She does it so I don't have to. I can like get the clip notes and like figure out. And Marjorie, you asked if you know, if the history hemmed me in or opened it up. And for me, it really opened it up. So reading something like um, Annette, Annette Gordon Reed's analyzing, you know, the documents and, and looking at what the history was, learning something that really made me think about this story differently was that Thomas Jefferson's um, wife, Martha, the Hemings family were a gift from her dad to the family. And so Sally Hemings, was Martha Jefferson's half-sister. Her father had children with an enslaved woman, and those were the wedding gifts. So that Thomas Jefferson's relationship with his wife, Martha, Martha died, and then he had at least four children with Sally Hemings, who was his wife's half-sister. And so what this made me think about was the intimacy and the and our, what does it feel, you know, how could that feel, like to imagine into those spaces made me want to reflect about pregnancy, about, um, about interracial relationships, about, uh, about so many things within the story. And so some of those things I tried to reflect into the present moment in the novella with this young protagonist, this young woman. Um, yeah, so I think it always, it just gives you more. You know, you just take things and you wonder about them and then you can project them. You can speculate. <laughs> you can speculate about what that means, what might mean in the present, right? So yep. that's what I was thinking about. I think I want to ask you, I'm going to ask Marjorie a question about research as well. So at one point in Indigo Fields, that main character, the Colonel, Colonel Rand, um, that we read in the reading, is given a history book by his son called A New Voyage to Carolina. And Rand expresses skepticism over what he calls Southern accounts of history, which I thought was hilarious. You know, he's, which, yeah, I've been there. So I want you to talk about, uh, can you talk about your research? Were you ever skeptical? And also, both this book and your first story collection, Birds, the Accidental Birds of, of Carolina. Mm -hmm. Can you add some things? Did you research birds? Because there's a lot of, of birds in this book. Yes. Well, to answer the first one first, um, I was skeptical of historical accounts of North Carolina indigenous history and black history. Um, I was early on when I first moved to North Carolina, I was interested in indigenous history, and I read a lot of the, you know, the conventional wisdom books, um, and they mostly seem to say, well, you know, after the Tuscarora War of 1711, 21st First Nations were wiped out, and you know, never heard from again, leaving farms and fields clear for settlers to come down from the Shenandoah Valley and, you know, wonder where'd they go, you know? So um, that was sort of not quite right, and I discovered that just by living and being an activist in my community. I went to my local river festival, and I met an Okanichi man, um, Chief John Blackfeather, and he gave a blessing. At the, at the River Festival, I went to a conference about indigenous history and I met a Tuscarora scholar who was working to put together a lexicon of Tuscarora words. Um, I interviewed uh, Lumbee people for another book I was working on. And then one day, a really close friend of mine confided in me, she had an adopted daughter, that her adopted daughter was Lumbee, which is the largest nation in, uh, in North Carolina besides the Cherokee, and that the adoption agency had told her to never tell her daughter her heritage, her indigenous. I know, I see the expressions on your face. What was that all about? So, um, that emotion and that awareness gave me a little bit of insight about how repressed history was um, as far as having an awareness, everyday awareness of uh, indigenous people around us in 
the South. And I was not the only one who was not aware of these things. Also, the same thing happened with black history in my community. You know, uh, uh, Michelle said I was an activist for this um, famous poet whose history had been repressed. And uh, so I thought there's something wrong about this. It bothered me. It made me mad. I heard you say that in an interview, and I'm like, yes, I identify with that. But the other thing, so, so I'm a journalist by training, and I was uh, like going around making sure I had everything right and checking it twice and reading all the scholarly material. But I also was having input from people in my community. Um, and that emotional input is what we need as writers to put together a story. So then there's sort of these combination things that happen. I read an archeological history about an indigenous baby buried in a pot. And it you know, was recorded, it was all kind of official history. And that inflamed my imagination. I found out more about it. I ended up using that in the novel as part of the history of Indigo Field and expanding it to create even more uh, babies in pots and creating a story about how Miss Reba as a midwife was involved with that whole story. So um, let's see, there might be one more thing I wanted to say about that. So, you know, fiction is about emotional accuracy and if you include history, I think like with Jocelyn, sometimes it takes you deeper emotionally and then you start getting excited and you're able to do both. Um, but uh, let me tell you about the birds. I'm kind of a freak for birds, um, especially you know wild birds and their migrations and parrots who are found in strange places where they don't belong like San Francisco and Rome. So I, I didn't know much about birds in cages. I'd never had one. So I had a friend, she took me on a let's go visit people tour of Durham, North Carolina. We went to a parrot cocktail party where all the parrots got let out of their cages and fly around the room, everybody's drinking, not alcohol for the parrots, I don't think. And everybody has their own little snack plates. And that was hilarious, you know, I just really didn't emotionally and with my sensory body, I'd never related to birds in a house like that. Um, and then there was another place I went, which was a bird rescue for parrots. Um, and I discovered that parrots um, grieve when their people are away for a long period of time. There was one uh, cockatoo whose people had been away for about 30 days and it was pulling out its chest feathers and just um, very despondent. And I looked and looked at this parrot and I, I realized it was grieving. So that became part of the story. So emotional research and, you know, scholarly research are both important in, a, in books like ours, I think. So. so how about, we were gonna talk about race Our next thing and is race empathy. and empathy. Do you want me to ask the question first or do you wanna go ask my question first? Uh, you ask your question okay. first. All right. So, new topic. Um, both of our books deal with race and ethnicity. Uh, they include both black and white and male and female main characters. And I wanted to ask about writing. I, I wanted to think about and I thought a lot about writing outside one's lived identity. I'm just going to make a side note. There's been a lot of talk about this. Every writer has to write outside of their lived identity or else all of our books would include clones of us, which is not the world we live in, right? <laughs> Every book can't only be black women of a certain age with a certain experience, right? We're, we always are pushing outside of that. But with that said, there can be real issues of authenticity, of accuracy when you're writing the other. It can, it can, it can be bad, I've seen it. <laughs> and so I guess I wanted to know, in Indigo Fields, you have um, the, the white colonel that we met, Rand, you have Miss Reba, who is a black um, older woman with indigenous practices as well. And you have uh, Bobo, a young man with Down syndrome, and a lot of other characters. And I was curious, um, 
What was your experience of writing across identity, and were you ever worried about it? Yeah, I, I thought a lot about it, and I was worried about it. I, really, I realized I had to get it right. For one thing, I've been mentored by some older black women, and if I got it wrong, they would know, and it would be <laughs> really be embarrassing. Send you emails. <laughs> um, and, um, but also, I decided that my rule was to subvert stereotype. That was my job in my fiction writing, uh, in writing all my characters who were not very much like me. Um, a lot of, most of my characters are emotionally like me in some way though, so that's one of the fiction writer's empathy tools. Um, but, so uh, by subverting stereotype, for example, there are a lot of novels and stories written in the South about older black women who are kind of subservient, right? And it's just a, a common trope, at least it was very much so in the past. So um, my character, Miss Reba, is, you know, you just wouldn't dare try to cast her in that role. She's a very strong-willed person. Um, and uh, she's powerful, right? So every character has a certain kind of empowerment. Um, Bobo is a Down syndrome teenager. He wants to be a man. He wants to grow up. Um, he's affectionate the way, you know, Down syndrome people are, who you might know. Um, and he's got some fears and timidity. And I kind of flipped the narrative about, you know, kind of the troublesomeness or the, you know, the, the, the kind of caught in a role nature that is the stereotype about Down syndrome people. And to me, he becomes the biggest hero in the book. He's the one who faces the crisis, faces his fears, and actually becomes a man during the crisis of the story. So um, I, I did also um, use some fiction techniques. Uh, is anybody here a fiction writer? Good. So. Um, there's the technique of point of view. Point of view is almost like tone in journalism. Um, uh, so uh, for Miss Reba, when I first drafted her story, it was this, this lovely, slightly ironic, very literary voice. And I was kind of proud of that. I thought that was really pretty. Um, but I decided that that was arrogant of me and I need to be humble and listen to what she really needed in the storytelling. What she needed was to speak her secret stories out loud in her voice. So there's sections of the book where she gets to do that, but only to her, um, the spirits of her dead family, because I wanted her to be able to write outside the white gaze, which is you know the way Toni Morrison calls the storytelling that doesn't try to um, play to a white audience. So she does that, and I think it's, it's pretty powerful for me. But then there's this troublesome young man, this white boy she's taken in who's hiding and eavesdropping on her. So of course, you know, she's, um, she's, uh, there's conflict that ensues about that. So, um, just one more thing I wanted to say about that. I, I did an event with Sunu Chandy, who's a poet. She's got a first book out this year. And um, we read each other's books. And her book, I know she's a very powerful attorney working for women's uh, civil rights. She also identifies as uh, lesbian, South Asian, Jamaican, um, adoptive mother. And so she uses very, she works very close to identity, to autobiography in her poetry. It's first person poetry. Um, she read my book and she said, oh, I get it. You write, you're writing from your identity as community. And I think that's spot on. You know, it was, uh, we need a community of voices to tell certain stories sometimes. So that's, that's how that's how I handle that, just by trying to be humble in um, accessing voices 
that might seem different from mine, but include my concerns and uh, that, that I really want to express honestly and carefully. So, yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So we are need to check time. Is there something else we? Do you want to? Um, yeah. We. How, how are we doing, Michelle? Let's add a little bit. Yeah. I think we have time to talk about your your genres uh, that you're working in the near near future dystopia. And I love that term. It scares the hell out of me. Near future dystopia. Um, so you used, uh, you had a, a lot of terrorism and violence erupting against people of color in the novella, My Monticello. And, but there's also hope in your vision. These people find ways to be creative and courageous to find a way out, to find at least a temporary respite in Monticello. And they were kind of, um, really, we're going to take over. You know, it's kind of wonderful. Um, so they're not victims for long. And you're really, it seems, having a conversation with the future. Um, and I wonder, you know, do you feel like there's hope in that future? Are you um, seeing, you know, in our near future, in our lives, that are there going to be these exoduses to safety coming for us? Yeah, so you've all heard the first paragraph of the novella. You know, this group, we have these little buses called Johnson and Charlottesville, and this group of like 16 neighbors end up jumping onto this jump bus, and Danesia, our protagonist, starts driving out of town, chased out of town, and ends up on this road. First Street is a real street right near my house, so I'm using like my route through, you know, the town, the map of the town that I know, and they end up taking refuge in Monticello. There's a few um, groundskeepers slash docents that are there guarding the house. It's in this time of unraveling. Uh, and so it is dystopian, right? Because the groundwork for those men to be able to come with fire and rouse these neighbors out is that there's this, this unraveling has happened. And the unraveling is um, not only a moment of white nationalism, but before that, there's these epics, it's a, it's a time of epic storms. It's a time, the cell phones have gone down, there have been these epic storms and, and the planes have gone down. So there's a sense of isolation and insecurity. I did write this before the global pandemic, but it has some of those echoes of how we felt in those first weeks where the world, the ground has shifted. And so only because those things are true, could these people come into the community and create wreak such havoc. Things have fallen apart. And so what I was, the dystopian that I was trying to create was tomorrow, but it was really just tomorrow. It wasn't 10 years in the future and, you know, the White House has been, ta you know, taken over by aliens. It's something, there's nothing in there that's unrecognizable. And the reason that's true is because I was writing very directly out of my experience of living in Charlottesville on August 11th and 12th. And I was speculating about the future, and I was thinking, what would happen if we continue to um, res not share power with one another, if we continue to neglect our physical and social infrastructure, if we continue to uh, support and elect leaders who point to the other and vilify the other and make a monster out of whoever the other is. Anyone who looks different, sounds different, loves differently, who um, is you know, creating this outsider class. What would be the outcome? Well, I saw the beginning of that outcome when the Ku Klux Klan came to our town, when men with torches circled around a statue and considered that a positive photo op for them. And so I was curious about what are the conditions in place? What would happen if this continued? And unfortunately, you know, this was before the storming of the Capitol. This was before some of the things we've seen since then. And I was writing this as a cautionary tale. This is what we don't want to happen. We, we, I'm, I'm hoping that if you read the novella and just in life, forget the novella, that we, that we choose to care about one another, that we choose to address climate change, that we choose to 
decide that when we invest in a community that doesn't look just like us, it is still investing in ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and we avoid <laughs> this group of people up on Monticello. The other piece was that utopia that Marjorie talked about. Even though it's a dystopian novel, I have this little utopia in Monticello because this group of neighbors along with the grounds people and others that come, a few others come, you know, they're taking refuge up in Monticello. They have like, you know, those cans of peanuts that they have at Monticello and the wine. They have the garden. They have someone with chickens. They have these kind of, um, they have th these vestiges of a renewable, sustainable community. They have to decide how they're going to, to treat one another. They write a hasty constitution. It's like a teacher on the first week of school. I was a public school teacher for 20 years. Danesia is our hero. Instead of someone with a machine gun being our hero, our hero is someone who's studying to be a public school teacher. And she is talking to, um, you know, she's setting, they, they decide to set a tone that is different. And it centers women, it centers people of color, and it centers uh, a whole different energy than perhaps we've seen in uh, some other spaces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, I was really interested in this fragile utopia, the possibility of these things. And being able to write that uh, in the face of something that was really kind of a horrible experience um, is interesting. And that's one of the powers of literature and of writing and of art is that you can put out there something that you think is a possibility. It's like an idea mm -hmm. seed. and then. I was staying, you know, I was really anxious about that. And then I wrote this book and I'm like, now you can read this and worry about what I worry about. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it can be empowering and it can be, um, I do think there's hope, uh, but I think it, the hope, it depends on, it depends on us, what we choose to do and, and what we choose to say. Hi. Uh, because you said that your work, um, you intended it as speculative fiction? It was, is that right? Um, have you, it reminded me of Parable of the Sower. Um, have you read that book and that author? It like escapes me what her name is. Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler. But so she's like, I recently learned of her and like read um, the first book, like Parable yeah. of the Sower. Yeah. Um, and you saying that just made me think if reading her uh, like speculative work like might have um, like influenced you somehow. Yeah, so Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower, which became, I think, a bestseller recently, right? It, because it was so on point. There's a wall, there's, you know, all these, a pandemic kind of thing. Um, yes, I read Octavia Butler many years ago. I read Kindred. I didn't read Parable of the Sower, which um, is a really good book. I've read it since. Um, I definitely am influenced by her and really by any artist that's just, she's like a weirdo, I love her. She, you know, she's, she doesn't really fit genre. She went into a genre and used that genre to talk about things that it hadn't been set up to talk about. She used the tool of that genre to talk about really exciting things, right? And so I love writers and artists and I realize musicians too who, who do something unexpected uh, within it, or mash two things together that don't fit well. So I, I do, I love her, and I highly recommend her, and I do owe something to her. My writing kind of comes out of a different space, but it has some, it definitely owes a debt to, to Octavia Butler's and other writers like that. Um, Marjorie. Marjorie, thank you. Yes. Um, as I was listening to you read uh, your story, the first thing that came to mind is, what do you see when you're writing? Um, because you bring us to a place with you. And how did you get there to tell us, to give us a visual? So what is it that you're seeing, if anything? Thank you for that question. Yes, I am a very visual writer. And um, I think it's true for most writers of fiction that um, you, you go deeply into a place where you just sort of tickled something at the surface, and then you're full on in the dream. So in my house, my husband noticed that, that I'm walking into things and like, he's asked me a question three or four times and you know, I'm right there in the car with Miss Reba, you know, looking in my side mirror. 
Um, I will say that it takes many, many, many revisions to get each sentence just right with no fogginess that might be distracting from the actual dream of the moment. So sensory detail um, and, and emotion, like everything has to be emotional. But thank you for that. Something in craft that was challenging and doesn't seem as challenging, it's all challenging. <laughs> Um, I think keeping at it is really important. You know, I published this book at 50, um, which is young, but it's not, but I could have given, you know, I, right before I published this book, my partner and I were like, maybe we should just give up on this writing dream. I mean, I've been, it was my third agent. I a, was a full-time full public school art teacher and just working at it for so long. And then um, you want, and anyway, just continuing to do it and not doing it for an outcome. Um, creating art, I met with Orange High School today and I talked to the students about, it's wonderful that all these great things happen in the book, but I think I would, I would do it anyway because it was so, there's something that happens to you through the process of doing the art. You're, you know, I was a public school art teacher forever and I had to tell myself the things I would tell little kids, you know, like, because it is, it can be very intimidating. It can be intimidating when no one wants it. It can be intimidating when someone wants it, <laughs> like all of a sudden when you're having success. And so I think um, I've gotten better at just that tenacity and just building up that muscle of continuing, probably like a runner does, you know, just keeping at it. How about you, Marjorie? Um, I have to say, you know, I worked on this book for 30 years, so uh, tenacity. tenacity was part of that and some ups and downs. And, you know, like, this will never happen. You got to keep going. So I have this, like, um, I wouldn't call it tenacity exactly. It's more like stubborn, stubbornness in my nature. You know, like, no, oh, no, you can't tell me I can't do it. Or it's like that little, little, uh, you know, like feisty. Um, but the thing that I struggled with with this novel was structure. I, I like to write long. It's a long novel. It was 800 pages in manuscript form at one point. I didn't even know what was going on. I couldn't remember, <laughs> from, you know, from the beginning to the end. So structure was really interesting for me and a real struggle. And I had a lot of help with it. I had a lot of readers. Um, and I learned to cut and cut. And what I learned is that when you do that, the true heart of the story just lifts up. Uh, and that, that was amazing and surprising because I had so many beautiful other characters. You know, Miss Reba's love life was in here. Oh my gosh, you know, that was so, so fun to write about. Um, but so structure, and how I ended up doing that was by creating very tight story arcs for each character. So every character has an arc of some kind. Nobody's like a, you know, a kind of an extra. Um, but also, I, maybe this relates to your question, ma'am. Uh, I created story arcs for the objects. So, for example, there are a couple of tables that are described in the beginning of the novel, and each table has a story arc that, you know, takes it through description, re you know, reversal of expectation, that there's one table, turns into a place that's going to be a fun dinner, and then it turns into a funeral, you know, a funeral food place, and then it brings up all kinds of other things, till at the end it has brought people together by sacrificing itself um, and saving the lives of people who are hiding under it in, in the great storm that is the crisis and bringing people together the way a meal does. And then at the end, well, I won't tell you the end. I can tell you that. But there's something at the end, too. So I just kind of tracked that using like Microsoft Word, Navigator, um, here's the table. Right. What's happening with the table? So that was kind of fun. Do you see your job as authors as to be to enlighten people, to offer hope, or mostly to tell a story? I think we're both, you know, we're telling stories. It's both and. We're telling stories. I did a lot of thinking about the end of my novel. I was working on it pretty intensely during 
um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement rising and the pandemic and some other things that were scaring everyone and that were uh, very hard to look at. And I thought about, do, you know, I, this might not turn out well. Kind of like in, you know, I have, I have a certain amount of dread and concern and, you know, a story like uh, Jocelyn's is the kind of thing I think about m what might happen if we're not careful. So I decided to bring in um, so a possibility, a dream of how things could be when everything is ruined. So I made a, a conscious decision to lift myself up and give a dream of possibility at the end, rather than have a sort of a literary crash and burn, everything's ruined at the end. How about you? I think story is super important, but you're always infusing story with what you think, what you believe, what you feel sometimes in a really subversive way like the first story where this black professor is running this you know experiment on his son i would not recommend that as a parent <laughs> you know that is not what i uh do with my own son um, and yet there's echoes in it that i can see that we do right so i think to to tell a story that's engaging to look at something careful i'll change it to look at something carefully to look at it from these different angles you know if you're telling a story about I think the utopia comes out in the dystopia because if you're looking at what should life mean or how should people be able to be, then you're going to see the good, the bad, the ugly. You're going to look at it through different characters' eyes. You're going to examinate and interrogate this thing so that the reader has a chance to formulate and to consider and to reconsider their own ideas about it, right? So we're, you're trying to show a thing, um, not give the answer, but pull apart the question and shake someone out of their own experience so that they have an opportunity to relook at, to recognize the question perhaps, form their own questions and start to consider what the possibilities are.